Um, welcome, class. I saw that you uh, got here just in time. And, uh, well, n not all the services were so great getting out of London. But one of the challenges, I, and um, I have to say the Service Design Network really sets itself up carefully for this, that when you're delivering a service like a symposium such as this, you have to be, have everything perfect. And congratulations. So far, everything wonderful. Now, look, it's a real privilege to, to be here. And it's also a real privilege to have you know, nearly 50 of my students here with us today. They're all doing postgraduate programs. They've come from all over the world. They go from social anthropologists to architects, to doctors, to traditional designers. And I think that says something about the way service design is attracting people from many different disciplines who realize something special is going on here. Now, the two key points that I want you to take away so fundamentally from this session today are the following. The first is that service design is not simply another design. It's not like graphic design. It's not like interior design. It's not just another word added in front of design. I think we have a special responsibility because service design, I believe, is redefining what design is. The second thing is that not only are we, as service designers, in the process of redefining the nature of design, but also how a designer can contribute. And I'm going to spend a little bit on this as well, because I think a special responsibility has fallen to us. Politicians are struggling right now to add value. We've got the managerialism in the UK, and the US has got its own problems to deal with from a political point of view. Big businesses are able to make an impact, and they are making impact, and that's where a lot of control has moved to. But businesses only operate if they can innovate. And because most of those businesses are in the world of delivering services, we are the engine of that innovation, service design. Don't forget it. We are that engine of innovation to the guys that control so much of employment, so much of value creation, so much of industry, and also in government as well. So it's a very special moment, and I want to elaborate much more on how we can use this special moment. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my thesis on this, about how I think service design is making an impact. I'm also going to talk as well about some of the work that our students are doing right now, because I think it illustrates not so much the things that we're doing, but the kind of companies and organizations that are coming needing to drive that innovation. These are just some of the names of the companies and organizations that we are working with right now. In our studio, we have eight major projects running live. They involve projects for Sainsbury's in terms of redefining the nature of the retail experience with the Design Museum, redoing the visitor experience with the Ministry of Justice, working with them on victim and witness support. So many different areas. Look at the list there. It's, it's so interesting because it covers so much of the territory from big industrial companies to services companies, well-known organizations in their fields to those that are just emerging. The way I like to think about service design is that it's, it's designed for the, for the other 80% of the economy. We've been very good at designing for the industrial sector. We've been very good at adding specific you know, design deliverables to organizations in the services sector. But the service sector is the engine of the economies, not just in the developed countries, but as we'll see in a moment, elsewhere as well. The reach is into whether it's in terms of transforming public services, whether it's associated with uh, translating technologies into new products, or it's creating transformative customer experiences. Service design can address all of those different elements. Now, if we look at the growth of services that have taken place over the last 150, 200 years, we can see three distinct revolutions that have taken place. That kind of industrial revolution that was coal-powered, the second industrial revolution that was 
electrically powered. We see throughout all of those the growth of that services sector building up and up and up. Now we're in a post-industrial and revolution that's powered by digital technologies. I spent 30 years in the technology sector, so I think I've, I've kind of done my time in the world of information technology. But some things are happening right now in the world of information technology which are truly revolutionary right now at this decade. And I'll explain a few of those in just a moment. But coming back to the reach of services, services represent nearly 60% of the global economy, even 47% in China. So this is a worldwide phenomenon that we are dealing with. Now, I said about how technology is changing things. The services that are delivering 80% of the economy are increasingly technologically mediated. Now, if I go back to the 1970s, and I do go back to the 1970s in terms of technology, we had kind of the birth of online processing. In the 1980s, we had the personal computer. In the 1990s, um, along trundles the internet. But since 2005, we have five or six major revolutions in technology, each of which is as big as what happened in each of the previous decades. Make no mistake, right now is an astonishing moment in terms of where digital technologies are coming of age. It's as though we've waited kind of 50 years for the computer to do something for us. Now, my goodness, it is. Whether it's in terms of big data, which you're going to hear about, whether it's in cloud computing, social media, mobile internet, or the internet of things, each one of these is as big as the PC was, as the internet was when it began. Each one, and they're all happening right now. Since 2005, if you look at a book like Dan Friedman's, you know, The, the Earth is Flat, you'll find that None of these were mentioned. Hardly any of the companies that lead in these fields were even in the game. So technology has now provided us a set of tools which allow organizations, which is why it's so fundamental to businesses and to government, to exploit these kinds of tools to transform the services they offer. But let's look at what we need to transform for, because this is a perfect storm of technological change. But there's also a perfect storm of big challenges to address. You know, one of, one of my students came up with a wonderful presentation going back about a year or two ago, and it was entitled, There Is No Planet B. I like that title. It summed up so powerfully for me what was going on. If we look at the kind of issues that you see behind me there, whether it's global warming, biodiversity, globalization, urbanization, inequality, the aging demographics, these are all forces which governments are grappling with, big corporations are grappling with, which is, as I look out at the, you know, the youth within this audience rather than people like myself, you know, We've not got long to Armageddon, in a way. And you might think, gosh, that's a bit dramatic. But let me just sum up how many days there are for you. You will all live 25,000 days, 30,000 days. That's a lifespan. Your working careers, if you look at it in numbers of days, a 40-year working career, it's 10,000 days, that's all. How far away is 2050 when all this stuff happens? And worse, is it 10,000 days, is it 12,000 days? And what does 10,000 days look like? You can all envisage, imagine you had to live on 10,000 pounds for the next 12 months, that's all you had. You'd look at every five pound note you spent, wouldn't you? So what are you going to do this week? That's five pounds of the 10,000. That's five days of the 10,000 days. You want to draw 10,000 dots? Well, it's only 100 by 100. Take a meter rule against a wall, mark off every centimeter. Just take it down one. Just take it down one by one. 
and you've got a meter square with 10,000 dots in it. It's not a lot, which says why we've got to do something. Now, before coming here today, I was looking at my shirt in the mirror this morning thinking, gosh, I hope I don't look like a preacher. <laughs> and I know, or like a vicar, and I know I'm preaching a bit right now, but, but it's something which says to us, we've got a very, very important task to do. Look, corporations get this stuff. Um, I work for a, an IBM company, which, you know, in the, in the 1970s, as a young industrial designer, it was just all hardware. Even as late as the late 80s, so, you know, just over 20 years ago, you know, 80% of its business was moving big computers and everything else was just kind of an add-on to selling big computers. Today, it's services which were 5% and more than 60% of the business. 400,000 people work for that company. You know, it's uh, one of the few companies that's been able to completely transform itself. It doesn't sell smarter computers. You, you've probably seen all the advertising around kind of smarter cities. It's about how do you solve customers' problems and how do you sell the services that go with that. Not services that add on and help you sell the computers, but services which are about making cities, making electrical grids, making health services, making water systems, making school systems, making transport systems better. Smart services. If you look at a company like Rolls-Royce, similar kind of deal. 14% of Rolls-Royce's business is from civil aviation now. That used to be all civil aviation. But if it had stayed that way, it would have been out of business. It's, it's the fact that it's moved into the services, whether it's selling power by the hour, the way it maintains and engages with its clients. Every aspect of this company is an industrial company under Sir John Rose's leadership in that 10 years that he led the company for, has been associated with driving a service level engagement with its customers. And the reason is very simple. If the customers spending their money on doing things rather than just infrastructure to make it possible, and you help your customer, whether it's a business to business customer or it's a citizen, to do the things that are important with their lives, then, then you are able to create value. And value translates for businesses into business returns. Creating value, capturing value. But there's a social imperative as well, isn't there? This is uh, our team. We just had run a workshop in, uh, uh, in 10 Downing Street with government. Well, government's got a pretty big share of the service business. You know, the top 25 go from 42 to nearly 58% of the GDP of, the, of their nations. I've included America there. Now, America is very interesting because although one tends to think this is the country that, I know, where services are provided by the private sector, it's all private enterprise, it's still nearly 42% of the economy is spent on services government services, public services. Massive difference. So we're working with government. We've been running a, an academy for the uh, Ministry of Justice. That's next week. We've been running so far six cabinet office policy schools which focus on it. And we run projects with government. We worked with Francis Maud and Jeremy Haywood to put on a program with, uh, with the help of IDEO as well for uh, the cabinet office in this area. Now we're working right now on the witness support, looking at how we can transform the witness experience. Francis Maud in government has made it really an absolute principle that the user of all government services are not, in this case, the criminal prosecution system, crown prosecution system, the police. The, the users are us, citizens. And we as designers, have to engage with projects like this in order to be able to represent not just the citizen, but represent the ideals to which citizens are trying to drive the services, which should be serving them completely and not partially. Our research that we're doing within service design is also focusing on how governments, instead of taking policy 
and translating that into a set of propositions and then going and asking, I don't know, Capita or Accenture to write the processes and then try to put them into production and deliver them in Sunderland, you know, putting them into practice and then finding, oh my goodness, the guys in Sunderland, it's not working. What we're working with is saying, look, that's the wrong way around. Start by understanding how that, uh, pro that policy might be envisioned actually as a service, as seen through the citizen's eyes. Use the service design techniques that you're all very familiar with. I'm not going to teach you about those kind of techniques. You're very familiar with those. Use those in order to be able to understand what the real needs of the citizen are and then envision an alternative experience that will enable that new vision to happen. So start from the inside out, not just the outside and Do the two together. And that's becoming a watchword. That's what we're teaching into all the policy makers in the cabinet office. In the health service, I mean, of course we've got the message, and they have too, that it starts by putting the, the patient at the center. But you might also remember that you have to change a culture. Now, if you are a consultant, and I mean a medical consultant, not a service design consultant. If you're a medical consultant and you think of the patient as being a syndrome with legs, then you haven't got the concept of what patient centric is all about. And so there's a lot of kind of re education needed here that is incumbent on us to do. We can't wait and expect someone else to get it, it's up to us to take these messages with that power and energy and commitment and argue our cause because we know it to be right and also because it is our duty to do so. So really, there's a kind of new agenda for design. We've got global challenges which we collectively face, the ones, that perfect storm of things that we need to get involved with. We need to be focused on service systems, whether it's working in the business-to-business -business context, like IBM or Rolls-Royce, or whether it's in consumer services, or whether it's in government. We've got to be able to blend that deep customer insight that you have with understanding what's happening with technology so the two can be used together. And we have to think about how we generate either enterprise or institutional value. And that's important. That's the reason why businesses and governments want to do this stuff, so that we create value for our customers and their customers and the citizens that we all are. Now, there are many opportunities for services. And I, there's a little model that I like to, to think about a lot, because it also tells us about how many companies are struggling in this space right now. There is the material world. Think of the material world as being everything above the Arctic Circle. It's like the ice caps. The material world is the solid stuff at the top. It's about 15, 18% of the economy in developed economies. So it looks like the map of the world behind me. Then we've got the tropics, down to the trop or the temperate zone, down to the Tropic of Cancer there. That's the world of knowledge and content. That's our world. That's the world that we as educators, those of you who are philosophers and writers and analysts and work in the world of software and work for the professional services companies, that's the world you know, the world of content and ideas. Then there's the world of doing things, which is most of the world. It's like your lives. You've got a bit of stuff. You've got a bit of knowledge. But most of your day, you do stuff. It's the world of actions. Now, services need to look at all three of those worlds. Let's take education as an example. The material world, if you're a Samsung, and we've got, uh, I think, 13 students from Samsung this year with us right now, it's the world of making tablets and projectors and uh, mobile devices. But what else is there? There's the world of course material, of author content, and then there's the world of actions in education. 
i picked this one because i know all of you as educators will be familiar with this kind of space so when you look at a space like that you look and think well what can we do how can we build solutions that spread across not just the polar region because that's a commoditized reason uh, region you know, you can look at the example of Sony here. Sony, for me, was the, you know, when I was growing up in, and going off to university in the 70s, I mean, it was Apple. It had the smartest devices. I just longed to have, when the first Sony Walkman came out, I was 30 years old. I wanted that, because I thought it would be cool. And then when I was 40, my, my wife bought me a Sony Discman. In the 19, when I was 45, I got a Sony mini disc player because I was always on planes. And when I was 50, I got the first Apple iPod. Now, what was that all about? What, what happened there? You know, Sony became, in a way, trapped in that polar region, trapped like a kind of polar bear pacing up and down as the material world and the world of technology commoditized around it. You needed to get down below into the world of content, into the world of actions, into the world of doing things. Why did IBM or Rolls-Royce kind of move into services? Because selling engines is very commoditized. Selling computers, it's very commoditized. Don't end up in the Arctic Circle. What is my customer doing that I can make this world a better world for them too? That's what the focus was. So that kind of model, whether it's looking at government, what citizens do, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in education, whether it's in consumer services, you can look at those maps and see what is the opportunity that lies for us to conceive services that create value across all of that space. And that's what we're trying to do with some of the projects that we're working on right now. Uh, this is a project, this is the, in fact the third project we're doing with uh, Sainsbury. We've worked with Sainsbury all about transforming the retail experience. If this is the retail experience of the future, and this is uh, a shot um, uh, from uh, uh, Taiwan, which is people photographing goods as they wait for the subway. If, if the retail experience is going to become like this, how do you add value? If you go to self-checkout, is the store just a kind of robo-store where robots check you out? Or is there something different that you can do to re-engage inside the store with all of the community of people that you are serving so that your staff become part of their experience? How can you raise the value that you're able to deliver and create more personalized services. This is a project that we did around bakery, but we're doing projects around sustainability, around uh, sustainable choices for customers, and many other areas as well. With the design museum, how do we turn a visitor experience into not one of just looking at the artifacts that are in the museum and displaying designed objects, but describing the design process and the underlying issues that people wrestle with as part of that process. And so we're working there, again, doing all the traditional things that you will do, but getting the design museum ready for its new headquarters in 2015, where there will be a compelling new visitor experience. Just some examples of the work that's going on uh, right now. In the world of healthcare, and this is a very interesting one that I, I was at the board meeting of Samsung uh, a couple of weeks ago in Korea, and we were looking at healthcare. You know, this is the world that companies are wrestling with right now. This is, you know, diabetes. It's a killer disease. Sadly, many of us who are in this room will end up being diagnosed at some point in our lives with diabetes, and our worlds will change. Now, the technology allows you to kind of glue a pump onto yourself and have continuous glucose monitoring. But does this picture in any way describe the reality of that? Or is it something else? Is the reality much more like this? Yesterday, I was diagnosed with diabetes. 
today life tastes bitter. That deeply human response to something. For many of you, think of your parents, how they are probably a bit like me, set in their ways, and if they were diagnosed with diabetes or have been, how does not just their life change, but everyone else's around it? And is this the only aspect of the response, a technological one? Or is there an opportunity to think very completely about the whole service proposition that can be created that is able to alleviate that despair and make sure that those people who have less than one month after being diagnosed with diabetes, they have to adapt, or their morbidity rate will double. They will die. So what can you do? Glue on a gadget to your granny and hope that's enough? No, clearly not. So our students worked on a very systemic approach. Uh, it was called The Circle. And it combined a peer group, so there were people involved, a whole program of activities, a whole load of different apps and other pieces that went with it. But it was a systemic response that was built around the human response that is so necessary for service designers. Another project came out of the Royal College of Art is phone charging for Africa. There are you know, five billion people on the planet now that have a mobile phone. And in Africa, something like 78% of the commerce in sub-Saharan Africa now depends on mobile phones. More than electricity, the mobile phone, more than the internet. This is what has brought economic growth to these regions. But only 4% of people can phone off the grid. Now, is it a solar panel with every phone, or is it a complete service? a service which allows people to take energy out into the field. Entrepreneurs, an entire business model that allows entrepreneurs to create a business around creating a service for mobile phones. It's not the device, it's the whole service experience. There are 10,000 people in the first trial right now, farmers who are now having their phones charged, which means that they can stay at work, not have to go home. The final project which I uh, uh, was involved with when we had uh, the Design London Incubator, and some of you will know uh, me from that world as well, was the most marvelous project. It was a waterless loo, a sanitation and energy system. But if you're going to bring sanitation to the 2.8 billion people that are off-grid for sanitation, you've got to create a whole service model. You've got to create the sanitation service that an entrepreneur can invest in to take the loos and the anaerobic digesters, to make them locally, have the parts, some crucial parts delivered for them, create an entrepreneurial model. This is some of the guys that were in our incubator. Uh, and then build a business. Now, the Gates Foundation have now given our guys here a million dollars to go from their first trial, which was the 1,000 units, to really scale the whole thing up now. But it's a service experience. Now, I, I bring these points together because the service designer's role has changed. You've got to understand as much about the business model and the digital technology as well as the design side. It's a truly transdisciplinary role at the heart of this. So going back to my premise at the beginning, we are redefining not just what design is in terms of service design, but design period. And we're engaging at a strategic level with government, and you must do as well, as well as with the major corporations, as well as those small startups that can make a big difference. The technology is formidable, and it's going to create a revolution, and those services can be designed by us, or you can throw them out to the world of the IT guys that I used to live in. And that's not the right answer. I lived in that world. What you can do is so much more. Service design is a transformative design approach. And it's necessary because we've got those two perfect storms colliding. So I leave you with this thought. Focus, focus, focus on creating value that allows those two worlds to come together to create positive transformation. 
design to create value, but design at your heart with values. It is the values that all of you have in your hearts and in your intellect that you must translate into action. Thank you.